Well, um, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it helps that you can see our names on our pictures um, th these days. Um, uh, as you can see, my name is um, Steve Innes. Um, I I'm um, a, a member and a bencher of the Inn, uh, and I was on the Barristers um, Committee until a couple of years ago. And I'm being delighted, I'm delighted to be joined by um, Vicky Wilson, uh, also a member of the um, Inn. And she has the distinction of being um, last year the chair of the Bar's Wellbeing um, working group. So she's a really good person to be um, joining this conversation with us um, this evening. Uh, she's also a member of the Family Bar um, and a member of Chambers in Goldsmith Chambers. Um, thank you very much to the Barristers Committee for inviting us to um, host this um, session. I hope um, uh, the people who are, who are joining us um, will find it helpful. Um, and I should also say um, thank you to Sam Hutchinson from the Education Department, who's going to be helping us um, in the background by um, running this um, session, the, the IT side of it, and taking responsibility for navigating through the slides that Victoria and I are going to show you um, later, so that we can ask in the manner of Chris Whitty um, on other press conferences for the next slide, um, please, when the moment comes. Um, as you uh, will have heard, um, this uh, session uh, is being um, recorded um, so that it'll be available on the INS um, website if you want to revisit it or if you need to duck out early or if other people you know might want to um, listen in if they couldn't make the session um, this evening. Uh, in that vein, can I take this opportunity to just um, draw your attention to a podcast um, which Vicky and I um, recorded um, a few months ago um, with Elena from the uh, Students Association uh, and that was um, about on the topic of dealing with pupillage um, rejection um, and, and I appreciate that that's pretty topical at the, at the moment because I think it was a couple of weeks ago that the um, results of the uh, pupillage application scheme were published. Obviously well done to people who were successful in that and Oh, commiserations and best wishes to the people who weren't and obviously encouragement to keep trying but there might if you're in that position there might be something on that podcast that can um, help you or you find find um, some encouragement so you'll find that on the inns um, website as well um, the format of this evening um, is that Vicky's going to give her part um, of the talk um, first I don't need to say any more about it she, she will uh, tell you all about that uh, after that I'll give you my part of the talk which is some practical tips and from my perspective on dealing with some um, well-being issues. Uh, throughout the course of the session, if you've got any questions or comments, then um, do please um, send them in via the Q&A um, function um, of, the, um, of the webinar. Um, and they'll be treated anonymously in the sense that uh, we might, I'm not sure, we might be able to see the name of the person who sent it in, but we certainly won't um, publicise that. So it'll be treated as an anonymous um, uh, question. Uh, and if it's convenient for us to deal with that and respond to it in the course of, um, of the session, then we will. Um, and then finally, just before giving our talks, um, can I just make um, this point that um, Vicky and I have been involved with various um, wellbeing initiatives, and you'll probably hear some, something about that this evening, um, for some time, but we're not um, medically trained, uh, we're not any experts um, in, in the way that, for instance, psychiatrists or other doctors might be. Um, we're in, a, I guess, a pretty good position to pass on some information and some tips um, based on our own experiences and the other um, uh, you know, um, uh, um, materials that have come to our attention in the course of um, our involvement. But th that's really our role to um, flag up some of the issues, to signpost some of the sources of help um, and, and guidance that will be available to you. Uh, and so we're not to be treated as giving um, you know, guidance that's to be treated as the law um, or, or any sort of expert um, assistance. But I still hope that you will find something this evening that's um, helpful to you. So with that um, in mind, um, Vicky, can I hand over to you to give your part of the presentation, yeah, please? Absolutely. Thanks very much, Stephen. If we could please have the slides up. Excellent. And in the work of Chris Whitty, next slide, please. What I'd like to start by doing this evening is to take stock really of how far we have all come in terms of beyond COVID. Now, the, the point you see I seek to make on this slide is that COVID has forced many of us out of our comfort zones. And it's become a, a really steep learning curve for many of us. And, and I identify some of the ways here for those of us who are practitioners. The first, as you see, is familiarizing ourselves with video platforms. 
I'm sure many of you were in the position that before March last year, you'd probably not heard of Zoom, let alone used it yourself. And, um, and, and then we have issues such as, as practitioners, we've increasingly had to learn how to navigate electronic bundles and adapt to remote forms of advocacy. Now, um, that of course, it's a very different beast as you um, know, conducting your advocacy by way of CVP and um, addressing a judge or a tribunal over that mode of communication or the telephone rather than face to face at court. Now, going hand in hand with that, of course, is we've had to find new ways how to communicate with our professional and lay clients. Looking at the example of a remote hearing with a lay client, of course, you don't have them behind you to slip you a bit of paper with their instructions on during a cross-examination. So um, I and others have found that we're tending to have to communicate on video, um, well, with our clients at a video hearing um, using WhatsApp or text message. And so the, these are all really significant ways in which we've had to grow and learn um, because of COVID over the past year or so. And the final and I'd say most significant one is that we've had to find new ways to recreate the camaraderie of the bar from home. By that, I mean the fact that usually, um, back pre-COVID when we were out and about a lot more, you'd come back home from a difficult hearing, you'd come back from court, you'd be able to go into your chambers in your clerk's room and say, I've had a really difficult day, this difficult client, and you'd have this mechanism by which you could download and speak to others about your day. Whereas when you're in the vacuum of being in your own home and not able to download in that way, I'd suggest it's actually a really significant and difficult change we've had to endure. So the, the, the reason I ask us to look at how far we've come is I, I suggest that we really focus on our achievements before anything else with well-being. What I've ended up doing over the past year or so is I've started keeping a list of achievements on my phone however small because I find I tend to forget them afterwards and then when you tend to look back at that list and see the little things as they build up such as learnt how to use zoom did my first electronic bundle did a video hearing all those sorts of things they actually add up and, and I think really build your self-esteem so I, I'm going to suggest that as um, a tool that people can use I, I find that really helps um, next slide please now, somewhat tongue in cheek, I say on this slide that it was easy for barristers before COVID, right? Well, obviously wrong. Life at the bar has always been demanding. It, 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 it's a profession that has many elements to it that make it difficult. I've listed some that were at the forefront of my mind here. There's the unpredictability. Then the next two bullet points go hand in hand because there's those times when we're not busy enough and we panic and we think our diary's empty, are we going to get more work in, what's going on? But by way of contrast, we have those times when work is overwhelming. I, I tend to think of cases a bit like buses, they never come in at a conveniently spaced, um, conveniently spaced junctures where you've got plenty of time to prepare between each case. What tends to happen is you have this um, quiet period in your diary, then subsequently you get three cases back to back and you're working flat out. Um, the next bullet point um, is, is one that really certainly res resonates with many of us at the moment, and that's the constancy of email demands. We all have our smartphones now, the phones ping all the time with messages, people find it very easy to fire off an email. And, and all of this builds up in terms of you not being able to step back and switch off from work. The final two bullet points are, um, we, we sometimes have to deal with very difficult clients. Uh, by way of example, with the work I do, I'm in family law. Um, I often tend to see people at the moments in their lives when they're at the heightened emotional state and it's very difficult and very emotionally demanding for them. And so, of course, that takes its toll as well. So there are various pressures and they can be constant being a barrister. And this was pre-COVID. And then add to that the extra layer of um, being a barrister during and after COVID in terms of the extra challenges that presents to us. Next slide, please. Now, I'm going to take everyone back to the first Wellbeing at the Bar survey, because something I'm sure many of you know is that back some years back, um, pre-2014, 
psychological well-being at the bar was rarely talked about, if at all. Now, this all changed with 2014 when, for the first time, there was a survey across the whole bar about well-being, and um, which was an excellent thing that that, was, that step was taken. But as you can see here, the key findings cause significant concern. Um, the, these are four headline points from that report, um, which um, basically concluded that one in three barristers found it difficult to construct, control or stop worrying. Two in three barristers felt showing signs of stress equaled weakness. One in six felt low in spirits most of the time. And a significant 59% of barristers demonstrated unhealthy levels of perfectionism. So this, this was all a source of some concern. So what happened from that point and what was done next? Next slide, please. Now, this was where the whole project of well-being at the bar came in. Now, for, for the benefit of those of you who don't know the structure, the well-being at the bar working group is a group of about 40 plus people and they are drawn into the group from different areas of the profession. So we have the bar council, we have the four inns of court, of course, including Greys. We have the circuits and we have the specialist bar associations. Each of those organisations has sent along a representative who's been sitting on the well-being at the bar working group. And, and the group was formed in 2015. And Steve and I have, in fact, been on the group since then and, and offering our contribution towards that group. And what we have here is the aims of well-being at the bar. And there are three key aims which um, that the well-being at the bar working group has at the forefront. And, and you see, as you see, the first one is to provide members of the profession with information and skills to stay well. Secondly, to support members of the profession dealing with difficulties that affect a barrister's professional life. And thirdly, is assisting those um, with responsibility or taking on a supporting role for those in difficulty or crisis. Now, I'm, I'm now going to turn to and highlight for you three really important um, bits of work that have come to fruition with Wellbeing at the Bar, which, which I draw your attention to you because I think there will be of assistance to many of you now. Um, next slide, please. Now, the first major development from Wellbeing at the Bar is we now have a Wellbeing at the Bar website. Now, this is an online portal and it's there for barristers, students and pupils and those with a management or other responsibility for barristers, such as clerks and members of staff within chambers. And you see here I've put the, um, um, the, the website address um, wellbeingatthebar.org.uk. I, I've given a list of the sort of things it covers. Um, it, it has been updated, it's regularly updated, and it includes COVID support and resources. So gathered in one section of the website it is, is um, a, a hub of information about the issues that people have found have emerged during COVID and been particularly prevalent. And, and of course, the website gives information on how to stay well. Um, it helps and guides on a wide range of issues which impact on practice and performance and in different ways, such as with podcasts. It gives guidance on having well-being conversations with others, what you do when a friend or a colleague is unwell. And this is something that Steve's going to return to later in this talk. And finally, the website offers policy and practice to support and develop initiatives. Next slide, please. Now, what we've got here just to show you all is the, the typical landing page of the website. This is quite an old shot of it, but um, what you can see here is we've got the various tabs at the top, I need help. So you can go to that and click on the issues that you need help with. Um, you've got help a colleague, staying well. And, and, and so the site is actually very easy to navigate in terms of, of trying to find what you need. Nowadays, it's got on the landing page, as I said, the COVID resources all in one place. It's got the most recent news and blogs, and it's got the assistance programme, which is the next major development. So next slide, please. Um, I, I think it is not as widely known as it should be at the bar. 
that we all have this free and confidential 24 seven assistance program. So what I'd like everyone to take away from this is please use it. It's paid for, it's there on your behalf, it's there to use. And I, I absolutely underline that it's confidential. Nobody's name's going to be recorded or monitored by anybody. Um, the, the only um, feedback we do get is in terms of the, the, the thematic feed, feedback in terms of what are the most common issues that tend to arise when people call. And, and that's um, again to ensure that all the future help we provide barristers um, is relevant um, for everyone. But I, I cannot emphasize enough that this isn't about spying on barristers and seeing if someone's in trouble. This is here as a free resource to help. Now, the, the part of that, um, just to clarify, this program is um, run by a company called Health Assured. And they also give us um, free access to an online health portal. It comes in the form of an app on the mobile telephone, and it's got some really good resources that I just flag up here, such as an interactive health assessment. So you can get tailor-made dietary tips and fitness plans. You can get fitness and lifestyle advice, such as detoxing methods, for example. Four weeks self-help programs, they vary. They're things like four weeks trying to stop smoking, but all sorts. Um, and then finally, mini health checks. So it, it's a really good resource that is available to everybody. And I urge you to avail yourself of it. Later on in the slides, there'll be some more details on how. And now the third um, major development in terms of well-being at the bar, next slide, please, is mental health training. Now, this is an online course and it's um, delivered by Wellness for Law on behalf of the Bar Council. And this is um, a specific co course to um, explore the challenges impacting upon practitioners at the bar and those within the profession. And here we've got the stated aims of the course. It, it's really worth bearing in mind for yourselves or anyone in chambers who would like to gain more understanding. We see it's to develop knowledge of mental health and common mental health issues. It's to gain understanding of some of the pressures experienced by barristers and those working with the bar and to help um, participants signpost for support and further guidance to generally promote good mental health and aid recovery within the profession. And finally, to provide an ability to identify and respond to mental health issues in ourselves and others. So, so that, that's the third um, feature of the work we've been doing, I highlight. Um, that's not to say that there, there are no, no other pieces of work. There's so much been going on. For example, um, you may have heard that some many chambers, over 70 chambers now have certificates of recognition showing that that particular chambers has implemented steps in order to promote the well-being of that particular set and the barristers and staff within it. And we're going to be in due course updating that process as well. So, so a lot of work has been going on so far with well-being at the bar. Next slide, please. Now, this of course brings us on to, well, with where we are now and with all that's been happening, what is next? Now, this is where the Bar Council's Working Lives Survey comes in. Um, many of you will have received a link to this survey, which in fact closed yesterday, it was the deadline midnight yesterday, and I can't put it better than Derek Sweeting QC has, who's now chair of the bar, when he explains that that survey is an opportunity for individual barristers to tell us their representative body, their experiences of life at the bar and give us a clear indication of what they need from us to support their respective practices and make life at the bar easier. Now, this survey is, is going to be very significant in terms of what happens next with generally promoting and enhancing our well-being at the bar. It was, to be clear, it was carried out by an independent survey organisation. Now, well-being is a very important component of the survey. Uh, you will have noticed that when I talked about the first well-being at the bar survey, that survey was exclusively a survey about barristers' well-being. But what we've come to realise is that, of course, well-being isn't this separate optional extra that we can extract from who we are as barristers and our working lives. It's, in fact, really integral to our working lives. And I I'd go so far as to say that maintaining well-being is an important part of our professional development. So the decision was therefore made that 
well-being should be part of a general working life survey to offer a more holistic picture of what's going on for barristers at the moment. Now, the findings of that survey will be in due course published in a detailed report um, with an executive summary, exactly like the um, previous 2014 report was published. And, and that survey will help shape the future of the profession in terms of its different needs. And, and, and what I will urge everyone watching to do is to, to bear in mind that through your specialist bar association, through your representative organisation, you have a golden opportunity to ask for the changes you want and the help you want and what you think the bar can benefit from to make your personal working life better. Um, if we can have my next and final slide, please. Now, what I've done here is I've highlighted what I think are some useful details. Um, the Wellbeing at the Bar website, um, wellbeingatthebar.org.uk is, is the great one to go to for pretty much everything. Um, I've given a separate link for the assistance programme, but as I say, it's on the landing page of the Wellbeing at the Bar website. So you can in fact go straight to Wellbeing at the Bar website and click on assistance programme from that. And it will give you the a password you need to get the free and confidential assistance and all the details about how it works and so on. The mental health training I've alluded to is run through, through the Bar Council and here's the link there. Um, as you can see that that's a quite a long link but that's the specific link to get you to the mental health training page and there are some um, various courses coming up. There's a, a wide range of options if that's something you'd like to pursue. We next have the law care number because again, another resource that's available to us is law care in terms of telephone assistance and telephone counselling. So that's an, an option B as well, in addition to our assistance programme. So there are two potential routes you can go down for any sort of help if you're struggling a bit. Now, my last bullet point, I think is a really important one in the light of what's been happening to everybody over the last year or so. Now, there's no denying that for a lot of people, lot of, lots of barristers, financially, it's been a very, very difficult time. Some sectors of the bar have been hit particularly badly, crime, for example. Now, the Barristers Benevolent Association is there precisely to assist barristers who could benefit from financial support. All four of the inns, including Grace, have put a significant amount of money into a, a COVID-19 fund, and that money is precisely to assist those who need it. So it, it, it's all done sensitively. It's all done confidentially. You don't have to advertise to anyone if you need that financial support. But just take a look at that link. And if you would benefit financially and, and feel that you, you'd like to speak to the BBA, please, please do so. Please be reassured that they really do handle things kindly, sensitively and with compassion and, and, and there is no shame whatsoever in, in, in asking um, for that help because we all know how difficult it has been. Now I'm, I'm delighted having finished this segment to hand over to Steve who's done so much for well-being particularly for grazing as well and so over to you Steve. Thank you that was uh, Vicky that, that was great um, uh, very kind of you to say that. Um, yes, yeah, so I should say um, I, I, uh, my role in this um, well-being at the bar um, group is I represent Grey's Inn uh, uh, along with um, Nikki, one of the members of staff. We go to the well-being um, meetings and, and feedback to and from um, the inn. I also have a role in our chambers, which is uh, Four New Square, and helping with well-being there and help write our well-being policy and, and things like that. Um, in, incidentally, if you're in a set of chambers uh, and uh, this is all, all sort of new to you and you're not sure what's available, um, the, the idea of the wellbeing working group is very much to sort of share this around um, the bar generally. Um, and so, for example, you will find on the website, there are sample policies um, that chambers can adapt. I did that for our chambers um, a couple of years ago now, using the, what was there and adapted it to, to suit us. So there are things there to get you started. Um, so I, I encourage you to make the most of that. And we found it's helped us in chambers and uh, it, it's easier than you might think to, to get moving really. Um, uh, can we have the next slide, uh, please, Sam? So, um, uh, well, this is a slightly old, old slide. Uh, fortuitously, I discovered afterward that uh, Vicky is a David Bowie fan, but I didn't know that at the time, uh, last week when I was doing this. Um, the, why have I chosen this as the sort of theme for my talk? Well, um, it was really just to emphasise this, that 
when we talk about well-being, um, I'm acutely aware that the sort of challenges that are being faced, particularly in the light of COVID, um, are, are quite different depending on how established people are um, in their practices, what sort of areas of law they operate in, um, and so on. Uh, and I can imagine that if you're starting out, there's probably nothing worse um, than hearing someone who's sort of more senior in the profession uh, giving you their tips, which involve probably uh, making sure that the wine cellar is well stocked or that you uh, go for a ride on your horse or your vintage car every now and again to, to cheer yourself up. And uh, I, I'm acutely aware that, you know, as I say, it's, it's very difficult for people who are starting out. I think particularly in this sense that um, when you've been at the bar for a while, you do build up these support networks um, from people in your chambers, obviously, uh, people you know from possibly from other chambers, uh, you know, the, the members of staff you have and so on. And, and it's, that, it's just that much easier um, to be able to pick up the phone to someone and say, I'm worried about this case or I'm checking in on you. Um, when you're starting out, if you've got a question, when, when, when Chambers was open, as it were, physically, it was sort of relatively easy to bump into someone or engineer bumping into someone at the photocopier or the coffee machine uh, and, 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 and grab their attention and ask that question. It, it takes something slightly more to um, dial in the number and pick up the phone and because and, and, you don't know whether they're going to be available to speak or you're going to catch them at a bad moment and that sort of thing. Um, so I do appreciate it's more difficult. Uh, it's also, you know, uh, in just the material circumstances, more difficult if you are you know, in, in shared accommodation with, uh, with other students in central London or something, restricted in your leisure activities, your ability to go out and so on. Uh, it's just that much harder compared with people who are, you know, in, in the nice houses in the country with, with all of those facilities. So I appreciate that. So I tried to put this in the sense of uh, tips I would have given to myself uh, when I was, was, was starting out. I couldn't find a photo of myself. Uh, 20 years ago. Um, so sorry about that. Um, but that, that's the terms in which I've tried to couch this. Needless to say, um, I, I wish I'd been told these some of these things uh, th that time ago. I might have approached things a bit differently. However, if I'd been told then, I probably would have been, um, probably wouldn't have listened to all of them and taken them aboard anyway. So such is life. So take, take, take these um, um, as you will, uh, with the same uh, caveat as Vicky, really, that I'm not a paragon of well-being virtue. Uh, as you can tell, I'm sort of overweight, middle-aged man who uh, doesn't exercise enough and all these sorts of things. So these are aspirational and things I wish I'd done throughout and wish I did a bit more of now. So please take them in that spirit as well. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Um, so just to, I'm um, so oh gosh, I'm sorry, that's rather bright. I, I, my eyes are slightly offended by the brightness of that slide, um, which is which was in our chamber's colours. Um, so just to emphasise really that, like everyone else, uh, these are the sort of difficulties that I, I experience and I expect they're, they're pretty common. Um, Vicky has really touched on these probably, so I'll go fairly quickly. Um, so yeah, not good at separating work from, from private life. Um, that's definitely been exacerbated by, by lockdown. Um, you know, people are just, a, it's a bit more chaotic. There's extra work on bundles and things like that. Uh, people know that you're not on holiday. You, you know, you can't, you're going to be at home. You, they know where you are. So there's an expectation that you can, you can send those emails. Uh, other people are having to juggle their own challenges, you know, around childcare, school pickups, you know, other partners working, whatever it might be. So it suits them to send an email in the evening rather than uh, during the day while they're doing something else. So it's totally understandable, um, but it has been e exacerbated and it just made that, that element of getting away from work that bit more difficult. Um, some of these, of course, are all connected. Um, the, the second one, uh, I guess, is a sort of personality trait of, of mine, but it's probably true of a lot of people. The reason why people are, to an extent manage to make it at the bar and be successful is because people who take things seriously, uh, want to do well, are, are self-critical, have all of those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, worrying about cases, trying to do our best, be, being anxious about them is, I think, perfectly normal and it's certainly something that affects me. Um, Vicky has touched on the third one, that, that, that sort of ever constant um, presence and arrival of emails, uh, the need to sort of feel that you should, you should be checking them, keeping an eye on what's there, keeping in touch, um, smartphone addiction uh, is a phrase that one here is used because, you know, uh, everything is on your phone, you can check it at, at any time uh, and therefore you tend to do that. Uh, certainly has affected me. Um, for an uh, unhealthy lifestyle, from spending too, too much time at the desk, I mean, that was true of me um, 
before um, lockdown. It's just that it was my desk in chambers as opposed to my, my desk at home. But it probably has got worse because everything now revolves around my um, lap laptop at home. Uh, there isn't the walk even to the train station that there was before. So that, that, that has not got better. Um, and then five, um, yes, yeah, so, so this was prompted by a question I was asked by someone last week, really. Um, and it resonated with me. I, I do think it, it can be difficult to arrange social events. Um, if your uh, you know, partner is a lawyer or if you're um, arranging something with other friends who are lawyers, then obviously people understand the way it works. Um, but otherwise it, it can be difficult. Uh, it depends on the area of law you're in. Um, but quite often it's the case, you know, you, you, you've planned this evening out for months or, you know, Wednesday night is date night or whatever, where, how you organise yourself. And then shortly beforehand, uh, the papers come in for the hearing tomorrow uh, or there's some there's some problem. Uh, and, and, you know, um, it's got to be dealt with. So you either cancel the date or you uh, or, the, or, the, or the social engagement or you go on it. But actually, you're not really there in every sense of the word because you're worried about the hearing tomorrow morning and knowing that, OK, well, you've still gone out for that meal. But when you get home late at night or early in the morning, you're going to be still doing some preparation. It does rather take the shine off these things. So that's that's certainly something that I've struggled with um, over the years. Can we have the next slide, please? So with some of those things in mind, uh, for what it's worth um, and with the caveats I've given, here are some of my um, tips, uh, which as I say, I wish maybe uh, people had shared with me some time ago. Um, the first one, I guess, picks up picks up on that theme, which, which is, and this is directed really people who are starting out. Um, let me tell you that as, as a middle-aged person, uh, it is extremely difficult to get fit and, and lose weight if you're starting from the position of someone who hasn't done that over the years. It's extremely difficult to change your eating habits, um, your living habits, your working habits, which have become ingrained. Uh, it's so much easier uh, if you can start out as you mean to carry on. Think about you know, what the consequences are, will be in 20, 30, 40 years time. And I think you have to, and I think there's an increasing awareness that you have to now approach it with this frame of mind. Um, these are things are not separate from my work. Th these are part of being able to do my work. You know, if you want to be um, still working when you're 65, you may need to be, you know, depending on what happens with your pension and so on. You need to be fit to work at that stage. Um, you, know, you, you, you need to uh, do the things that can increase your stamina, um, your ability to work, your ability to be healthy, well-being, working, because they're not separate from work. That they are part of being able to do the job well and being able to carry on doing the job well. You, you won't be able to do it if you're ill through stress or you know, if you get tired, you won't be able to work effectively and all of these sorts of things. So they're interconnected. So you must treat keeping yourself healthy physically and mentally um, as part of your preparation uh, and, and, and work of doing the job. And I think if you see it in that way, um, it, it can be helpful in, in encouraging you. But as I say, if, if you try and set those goals with a view to being able to you know, maintain that stamina, that longevity in your practice, that is the way to do it. And I certainly not um, uh, didn't achieve that myself for 20 years. I'm you know, looking at it and being a bit better about it now. Um, but yeah, that, that's the wrong way around. You need to start when you can, to be frank. Um, number two, um, holidays really are vital. Um, I, I was talking a while ago to someone who deals with um, cases where barristers are being, um, probably use the wrong terminology, being prosecuted um, or, or, you know, go through disciplinary proceedings um, because of their regulatory or disciplinary issues. Uh, and, and she told me that there is a really quite striking connection uh, between barristers and lawyers who get themselves into difficulties um, and barristers who don't and lawyers who don't take holidays. Um, and um, it, it may be obviously what's causation, what's correlation, we can have a debate about that. But I, I think the point really is um, if you go away on holiday regularly, um, A, it's a sort of rest and a change of scene, um, but B, um, it, it gives you perspective. Um, I, I think probably most of us, if we're honest, have recognised that sense where you, you're coming to the end of a spell where you've been working hard for weeks, you haven't had a holiday, and you just feel, I need a holiday, and, and everything, all the work is taking longer and is more painful. Um, but also you find you start to become more affected by it. You, you, you worry more that the, the sort of the hits that keep coming because you lose a case or a hearing goes against you, whatever, the sort of hit feels 
heavier uh, and, it, and it's sort of tougher to bear. And, and and then those sort of niggling sort of anxieties about I haven't done my tax return or something else, whatever it might be, um, start to weigh heavier. And I think it's to do with not having the perspective that you gain from stepping away from it and being able to look from the outside in, as opposed to just being in the middle of it. Um, and, and I think that, that that that's my crude explanation for that possible link between people who get themselves in difficulty. Um, if you think about, if you've read any of those sort of high profile cases about, it's lawyers, it's often, they're often solicitors or trainee solicitors and people who reported, people where you know, something's gone wrong. And um, if someone is sort of secure in their environment and, and got perspective on things, they would hold their hands up and say, I've, I've made a mistake here that that document didn't get served on time. And that's a problem. And, and probably the people around you in the office will help get it sorted out. You know, and ultimately you have insurance for those things. Where people get themselves in real difficulty is they're not able to deal with it. And they say, um, ah, um, this is gonna be a big problem. It's gonna be the end of my career, uh, the end of my standing in the profession and my place of work, my company, whatever it might be. And then there's the temptation to create that email that wasn't in fact sent at the time or um, you know, tell a white lie about what happened. And of course, it's that that massively compounds the problem uh, and ultimately cause someone to get disbarred or struck off um, because it's a dishonesty matter. And I think that in those cases, often it's a lack of pers um, perspective, a lot of lack of sort of understanding of how something can be dealt with, a sort of panic um, and so on. And, and I think those things are less likely if you're taking breaks and are able to get away from work. So there are many, many benefits of, of holidays um, that's, I'm afraid, a slightly cautionary tale about, about one, one aspect of it. Um, the thing that helped me massively, I noticed, was when my children reached school age and um, th they were on school term times. Uh, and so I was able to sort of put, um, you know, at least one week of the summer holidays or, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the half term weeks and so on in the diary. And it didn't necessarily mean that I, we were going to be away on hol family holidays. Um, but it meant there was a bit of an expectation that that week was going to be different. I was going to be at home rather than in chambers. We were going to be away, even if I was doing some work. And there was going to be a change of scene. And as the effect of breaking the year up into chunks of six, eight, ten weeks, um, and the year becomes more manageable like that. If you don't take holidays, the year just stretches ahead. And, and one piece of work, one case, is just followed by another one. And, and you never have a chance to, to restock. If you have breaks... The year divides itself up. Um, you, you can pace yourself. You can know you're working really hard, but there is going to be an end in sight. You can think, well, I've got that trial coming up later in the year, but that'll be after my holiday. And you can compartmentalise it and worry about it a bit less. So there are many, many reasons, I think, why taking holidays are, is a vital part of what we do. Of course, you know, because we're self-employed, you think, well, I'm not earning that week. It's a complete false economy. Everyone will tell you that from the clerk's room to, to other members of the bar. It's hard to maybe gauge that when you're starting out, but it's definitely true. Um, three, dealing with emails. Um, I'm embarrassed to say I only learned this about a year ago, but it, well, it didn't quite change my life, but it put me in the right direction. Um, so on my phone, like everyone, um, I suspect, you know, my chamber's emails come through to that. I can open them up and wherever I am, I can read my emails. Um, th that's fine. Um, but it used to be the case that that little notification came in, says here an email has arrived. And then when you were out walking the dog, you could look and see, oh, help. Uh, I've got four email notifications, better check what those are. All I've done uh, is, um, is switch those notifications off so that the emails still come through, but I don't get anything telling me there. So I don't want to look at my phone and see there's a, there's a list of, um, of, of emails that are waiting for me and I ought to check. And psychologically that has helped a lot. Um, I'm sure there are other things you can do, uh, and if you don't know how to do that, um, ask someone because it's you know very straightforward. Um, but but it but it does does make a difference, and you need to I think get yourself out of that mindset of feeling uh, I should be checking my phone um, all the time. I went to uh, a session a few months ago, and um, one of the tips that um, was mentioned was was just this: um, you know, monitor how much you are checking your phone. Um, uh, you know, if you're at your desk, okay, it's not a problem. Um, but if you are, you know, going out for a walk, going out to buy your lunch, uh, doing whatever it might be, um, just think, 
uh, do I feel the need to check my phone when I'm doing that? Um, I suspect this will resonate with a lot of people. You know, I, I sort of walk the dog for 20 minutes or something, and I think, oh, when I get to the top of the hill, when we're turning around, I'll just check my phone. Uh, and there's absolutely no need to do that. You probably are going to take your phone with you in case, you know, there's an emergency or um, you, know, you want to take a photo or, or whatever it might be. But do I need to check my phone when I'm out? No, absolutely, I don't. And just having someone raise that made me think, that's right. Um, you know, I'm taking a walk to take a break, make it a proper break. Uh, you know, when I go out to buy my sandwich at lunch, when I'm in chambers, that, that's 20 minutes away from my desk. Why am I cutting it down to the walking time and then five minutes checking emails and then the walking back time and, and basically diluting the benefit of that break from work, that chance to switch off for a few minutes. And, and once someone mentioned it, I thought, yeah, that is a problem. Uh, and, and just knowing about it and monitor it and have been able to improve that. Uh, so I, I recommend that to you. Um, the fourth tip is using the auto reply. Um, of course, you do that if you go on holiday. Um, I used to think, why do people do it over weekends? Um, but because, uh, of course, it's the weekend. But as I say, weekends have become less sacrosanct. So I think it is a good idea. Of course, if you put your auto reply, there's nothing to stop you checking your emails. But it just creates the expectation in the person who sent it that they won't be getting a response. And, and that, in turn, I think, takes the pressure off you. Um, to, to respond. Um, re related to that, I, 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 I don't know if this is common for other people, but there are more and more emails now. And, and I think what has become more difficult for us at the bar is that sort of extended period of doing uh, a deep, um, deep thinking, you know, total concentration on a particular piece of work, you know, the skeleton, the, the pleading, the advice, whatever it might be. It becomes much more staccato with interruptions. And um, I, I, I've noticed a few more people doing this. I've been trying this myself. Just put the auto reply on, you know, one day a week or something. It used to be the case, you know, um, we, we were away in, physically away in court. No one expects you to answer your phone uh, or your email while you're in court because you can't. Um, no one needs to know whether you are in court or not. So, so make use of that, I think. And, I, and I've noticed people, um, as I say, and, I, and I've been putting my email, but maybe once a week or something like that, for that day when I want to have a clear run at doing that difficult advice or whatever, um, just put it on that says, um, for today, I'm, I'm in, heavily engaged in a task. I'm not going to be checking my emails until tomorrow morning. If it's urgent, you can call my clerk. People will still e email you. If it's urgent, they can get through to you. But you then don't feel any check. Now, the reality is you might check at lunchtime or something like that. But just that uh, fear it takes of, uh, have I got to respond immediately or read everything immediately? Uh, no, um, it gives you that little bit of breathing space to uh, focus on your work and be a bit more productive. So I, I, give that a go, maybe. Um, so um, point five, um, everyone talks about the benefits of exercise, and that's undoubtedly true. You know, it's healthy, um, gets you outside, fresh air, you know, helps with fitness, stamina. All of that is true. Um, I just wanted to focus on this sort of one aspect of things, which is just um, trying to get a proper break from work. Um, I think, you know, the answer in, in, in lockdown for a lot of people was go out for a walk, go for a run. And, and, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do that because absolutely a good thing. But um, I think if I go for a run, um, to an extent, I can still be thinking about work um, while I'm doing it. And, and, and it depends where you run and, and how you know, intense it is and all of that sort of stuff. And the same of about going for a walk. Um, I, 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 it doesn't matter, but for me, I, I've a couple of years ago started playing hockey again. And I just found doing that, playing in a match or a training session, uh, mainly because I'm so unfit, got to concentrate totally on chasing that white ball around and being in the right place rather than thinking about work. And I, and I think, you know, if you can find something like that, it doesn't have to be sport or exercise, you know, singing in a choir, doing something musical, you can think of your examples, but something like that that genuinely prevents you thinking about work for a period is very refreshing um, for the mind. Um, so try and do that. The other thing I found was that I, I, I think pick one thing and say this is non-negotiable. Every Tuesday night, that is my hockey training. I'm not going to miss that unless I am away. Um, and, and so if I've got work, it's got to fit around that. Calls on, on Tuesday nights, have to be done by five o'clock so that I can get ready. And life goes on. Amazingly, everything else fit around that. And you can't do that with everything and have things like that every day. But if you have something, you say, this thing, 
is really important to me, I'm going to keep it. Um, the fact that it's for me an external event where other people are there and there are set times makes that easier. But it can be anything. It can be you know, cooking a family roast dinner, uh, doing your choir practice. Um, you know, obviously you can think of lots and lots of examples. Um, but but the one thing you try and have something which is, you know, which is not going to be sacrificed uh, unless it's really extreme circumstances. And, and and you find if then if it's you pick that one thing, it's that much harder to keep. Uh, sorry, it's that much easier to keep to it uh, and, and harder to find excuses to, to drop it. And that can be very valuable. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, yeah, so um, I'm conscious that some of our audience might not be self-employed, might, might be at the employed bar, um, but uh, maybe this is a tip that's biased towards people who are self-employed. But something I've come to realise over the years is, is just this. Um, there are undoubtedly swings and roundabouts for being self-employed, cash flow and all of those sorts of things. There are definitely downsides. What you have to do is make sure that you use the upsides. Um, there will be times, as I've already mentioned, where dates or social events get cancelled, periods of really intense work where it's just haggering. You have, I guess we all accept that as part of the job. But if we're going to accept that, then we have to also take advantage of the benefits of being self-employed. When you finish that case, there is no one to tell you you have to be in chambers the next day, still less that you have to be in by nine o'clock as opposed to 10 o'clock or whatever it might be. Um, and, and, and I think this is the sort of thing I've discovered as part of a family. You know, my wife has come to accept there will be engagements that are missed and things like that. But uh, when, when, you know, that busy period has come to an end, take advantage of it. Take a day off, take an afternoon off, whatever it might be. Go out for lunch on a weekday. Oh, it feels a bit naughty. It's a school day fine but you've earned it you know you've you've been busy maybe you've earned a bit more money during that busy period that can't be sustained indefinitely but enjoy the time off celebrate the fact you've just achieved you know finished a big case or a big piece of work whatever it might be or a busy period um and and, and savor the time off and treat that as the as the swing rather than the roundabout of being very busy um the next tip is be kind to yourself. Um, you can interpret that um, in, in a number of ways. It's sort of about not um, beating yourself up if you miss engagements, not beating yourself about not going to the gym, you know, as many times as you like this week because you're exceptionally busy and so on. It, it doesn't help you to, to do that. Um, what I sort of meant is, is particularly in, in concrete terms is that um, you know, sometimes there are ways of just making life a bit easier for yourself. Uh, we go through those busy periods where you know, you feel, gosh, I'm close to breaking point here. You know, this is this is tough. Uh, I'll get through it, but uh, for the time being, nose to the grindstone and it's hard work. But I think in those moments, if there are little things that you can do to help yourself, then do try. You know, I'm thinking about it's probably silly little things, but you know, I'm, I'm I normally go standard class on the train. I'm not a sort of big spender. Quite the opposite, my friends would say. But um, th those occasions where you know you're going to be really busy, but you know, pay the extra thirty pounds or whatever for a first-class train ticket, because that two hours that means that I'm sitting at a table with a seat and I'm getting a meal served to me, and I can, you know, either do an extra hour's work or not, versus being in a cramped um, compartment. For that price, on that particular moment, it's well worth doing it. And when I arrive, I will feel much better about things. Okay, if you're going away for a case, um, you know, as um we all have our own budgets we've got to stick to and so on but on occasions where i thought you know what, i'm going to pay a bit more because i'm going to be there for a couple of days and if it means i go stay with someone that has a gym and a swimming pool and i can do that in the morning uh, it will make me feel a lot better when i'm there and make me look forward to it a bit more the extra whatever 50 pounds is is well worth spending i think to um make life a bit bit easier when you can um the next tip is about i've called it being avert about your well-being um, and what I m mean, I think, is this. Um, it used to be the case, until quite recently, people were very reluctant to talk about these things. And of course there was, and obviously in places there still is, um, shall we say a macho culture at the bar, you know, um, sending emails off late at night to show everyone that you're working really hard, that, that sort of thing. I've realised now, and, and as you remember, this was tips to my, myself uh, 20 years ago, I did that when I started out, but I realised it's counterproductive. Um, people don't want people obviously don't want to get those emails. And if you got that email, would you think, "Oh, what a hero! He's working at two o'clock in the morning," or would you not actually be rather worried and think, 
Has he rushed that so he can get to bed? Has he really done his best work at that time of night? So, well, that will be my feeling now. So I, I think it's a, you know, it's a good idea to avoid working then if you can. Obviously, sometimes you can't, but certainly if you can, avoid sending the email off at, at that time. So the best I think to try and do that. Uh, um, and by being avert about your work, what I mean is this, that you know that, that email that comes in on, on sort of five o'clock on Friday, um, you're not going to, if you decided I'm not going to answer it then or I'm not going to work on it then. Um, um, it does go through, why, why are they sending this now? Are they expecting I've got to work on this over the weekend? I, I think it's um, becoming acceptable now to send a quick response along the lines of, thanks for your email. Um, I, I, I'll look at it on, on Monday. Uh, I'm not going to be working this weekend because I, you know, I want to refresh. Uh, but when I'm, you know, so that I'm, um, you know, on the best form to look at this at the start of next week or something like that. Um, you can think about the examples of when that when that will apply. But pe people, I think now respect that uh, that you, as part of you giving them the best service, you are making time to do their work properly um, and not resent doing it, but doing it at, at the best possible time. And so I think being candid about that. Uh, I'm not saying there's an agenda you've got to push, but I think um, sticking up for yourself, but explaining what you're doing, I, I think the pendulum has swung a bit. And I think that people generally respect that. And I think that if you um, send those sorts of emails, as I say, not in a political, aggressive, passive aggressive way, but just explaining what you're doing and, and why they might not get something immediately because you'll think you'll do a better job if you do it, uh, slight, you know, take a bit more time over it. I, I think that can be quite helpful for you and generally um, is, is well received. So I'd be interested in if, if anyone has any observations on that, but that's been my experience. And certainly when I've received messages like that, my reaction has always been good on you. Fine, yeah, it wasn't urgent. Um, and thank you for sort of managing my expectations and explaining how you're treating it. So I, I assume that other people feel the same way. Um, number nine, um, communication. I, I just make the point really that, you know, we're, we're not an island. Um, of course, the job can get us down, but remember that the people around us um, care about us. It's distressing for them if they see that we're working really hard and struggling. Um, but, but, you know, don't, don't overlook other people around you. Um, share your concerns with them and talk, talk to them about it. Uh, you know, ask them about their day. It sounds like a really silly, facile thing to say, um, but, but it is important. And hearing about what other people are up to is a great sort of way of, of, of um, you know, keep keeping you grounded and realising that your concerns aren't the only ones. So I recommend that. And then number 10, I, I, I'll be quite quick on just um, people asked me last week, um, you know, how did how can you sort of make time for these things? And just I, I was reminded of a tip that I saw from someone on Twitter, which is just when she goes away on holiday, this person um, books out the Monday when she gets back um, so that um, you don't get back. And, and instead of being able to unwind, relive the joy of the holiday, you know, get over the travel, do the laundry that needs to be done. You're not having to draft a skeleton for Monday. It's up to you. It depends on the practice area. You may well be working on Monday, but you, you don't want to be in a court hearing that's meant that you've had to have done a skeleton argument beforehand, which will have meant that had to be done on the weekend or something like that. So, so think about that. Think about, you know, if you're going away with your mates for a weekend, um, you know, and you're going to be traveling back on Sunday evening, do you want to have to leave a bit early on Sunday because you're going to be working? Or, or is it better to take Sunday morning off and make sure there's nothing in the diary so that you can properly enjoy the weekend? So uh, yeah, I call that sort of putting a buffer around events to try and make them happen. Okay, so th those are my tips and I, I hope that's some, as I say, they're aspirational and um, people can adapt them as they wish and uh, ignore the ones that don't resonate with them. Um, th uh, let me just um, check, yeah. Um, uh, um, uh, what I was gonna do is, um, we, we do have some, some case studies, but uh, I, I don't want to take too long on things. Um, um, Sam, can we have the next slide, please? Um, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, um, these were, um, I wasn't sure how long it would take us to get through our talks and how long the session was. I don't want to be, keep people too long. Um, I uh, put these cases up and we'll maybe just talk about these for, for, for three or four minutes. Um, I just really uh, wanted people to, um, to read these and and to I think maybe just do one or two reflect on uh, the things around you and, and supporting members of um, chambers. Um, th this particular case study 
um, as, as you can see, talks about, uh, in this case, a pupil, and you're worried about them and being at, being out of character um, uh, and so on. And, and I think um, well, all of these is probably no right answer, but what I've been really hoping that people will reflect on is um, uh, uh, yeah, the need to keep an eye out on their, on, on their colleagues, and, and, and that applies to members of staff in your chambers too, um, and, and how you might uh, approach a conversation with them. Um, uh, uh, the, when I was thinking about this this afternoon, I did have a look at the wellbeing website uh, and, and I have to say I spent some time looking at it because um, there's lots of really helpful materials there and this, this re reminded me and re reinforced that in my mind. Um, the, there are, for example, pages on how do you initiate a conversation with someone if it's you who's the person who's got an issue uh, or if it's you observing someone else who you think might have an issue. Um, so there's, um, there's lots of good um, tips there and, and guide you through to do that. I wondered, Vicky, if I can bring you in here, um, do you have any sort of thoughts about how you can start a conversation with someone who you're possibly worried about? Steve, I'm going to absolutely echo what you said about the website mm. because the Help a Colleague page has the practical tips. A couple of bits I'll highlight is asking the mm. open questions like, what can I do to help? And an opening question, how are you? Rather than trying to prob problem solve, practical offers of assistance are ver very welcome indeed. So, so re really, we can do no better than to highlight that page and also emphasize maintain confidentiality. Um, mm except for ethical situations where you're obliged to disclose concerns, um, you, you need to have any such discussions, um, I would suggest, in confidence. Um, Steve, I'm just going to pause because we've got two questions and with yeah. time, I wonder whether we might quickly turn to those. Um, yeah, good. We've had one person has um, asked, um, after dealing with an emotional client or a difficult client, how do you ward off stress? Um, I'll, I'll give that a go first then, um, Steve, mm. can thoughts. Um, I, I'm going to say be calm, matter of fact and be firm with boundaries. Um, it, it's easier to do if you're a, a bit more senior at the bar. If, if you're starting out in your career, do ask a more senior person for practical help on how to deal with this. Um, but what I find, for example, with someone who's quite difficult is showing that you've mastered the case and read it inside out tends to calm them down a bit. Setting the agenda at the beginning of your discussions and not letting them divert the discussion, say, well, I'm going to talk about this, but being quite firm and saying, well, we're going to go through this and we're doing it in my way. And then at the end, if you've got any questions, we'll deal with that then. If you're worried that they're going to be difficult in the sense of complaining, that's why I do um, hearing summaries after each hearing, because I find that just summarising in a nub the advice and what happened is very helpful to you to confirm that you've approached the case with authority. On emotional clients, the final point I'll say really is look at what's behind them being emotional. Are they scared about the hearing? They probably are if they are not familiar with court procedure so in fact you can allay their emotional um, outpourings by telling them a bit about what's going to happen where they're going to sit if it's on the phone what they have to say what happens next all those addressing all those practical things and and um, finally on the emotional stuff look at the psychology behind it in terms of if you've got two clients as I have had fighting over the cremation fees of their family pet it is not because they're fighting over paying 30 quid on who's going to pay the cremation fees for them that fee represents the end of their marriage and the psychological difficulties and sometimes certainly in family law I find you need to give people an elegant way to climb down without losing faith so that's my offering of an answer to that Steve what's yours? No um, that's all of course some very sensible um, I, I think um, for me a, a lot of the answer to these things is just um, it, the problem or the, 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 the issue will be what it is but I just remind you you know, try not to make it worse by feeling guilty about it or, or beating yourself up about it. Um, you know, there, there will be cases where clients are unhappy or emotional and so on. Um, that, that unfortunately will happen. Um, but, you know, um, it, it doesn't mean that it's your fault. Uh, we all do tell, tend to dwell on these things. But, you know, I'm afraid you, you do have to have an attitude of, um, to an extent, on, on with the best case, but the next case. But don't don't be cross with yourself that, you you know, you've been invested in it. You wanted to do the right thing for the client because that's perfectly normal. Um, and so as I say, just be kind to yourself and accept that that's normal. Uh, allow yourself to 
um, reflect on it, but you know, you're not abnormal in that way. Um, it's, it's not a bad thing that you want to do the best for your client. And, and just so you say, tr just try and treat it in that way rather than um, making it even worse than, than it is. Um, Vicky, the, the next question we, we can deal with this was, um, uh, how can barristers, particularly juniors, uh, know when they're under an acceptable level of stress for the bar, bearing in mind what you said about the bar being a stressful job and having ups and downs, or when it's time to leave for health reasons? Do you want to tackle that first? Yes, of course. Um, what I'd say is that your pupil supervisor or formal pupil supervisor is a really good resource if you feel comfortable speaking to someone within chambers. And, and what I think you need to do in that scenario is get a bit of a sense check about what's going on and talk it through with someone. Um, if, and it's totally understandable, if you don't feel able to have that discussion within your chambers, what I suggest you do is actually get in touch with the inn, because I've certainly dealt with, and I'm sure Steve as well, people who've had that kind of um, thought and uh, are concerned about things. And, and what, what, what the inn has done is um, referred that person or someone who's in their field to ha have a very confidential discussion about it and to explore all options. And that takes the stress off in, in terms of uh, not, not worrying about it bouncing back to your head of chambers or, or whatever. So, so, but, so my main message with that one is, is sense check by talking to someone who understands the profession. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and clearly, if um, we're talking about health reasons, then, you know, the GP or the doctor is the first person to speak to because, you know, genuinely, if it's a medical issue, they're the best person to help you with that. Um, I, I would just say, um, I, I apologize again if this sounds like an advert, but um, do have a look at the Wellbeing um, at the Bar website. Um, there is a particularly good um, video by um, someone who's a great friend of the um, of, of the association, if you like, uh, called Dr. Bill Mitchell. Um, uh, and uh, A, he's very easy to listen to. He's got a lovely Scottish um, accent, but he is extremely knowledgeable about this and um, good with lawyers. But um, he, in that video, and in, indeed, I think on materials that you'll see on the website, um, there is an explanation, there's a graph, um, but basically with a sort of semicircular curve. And it's called something like the Yerkes Dodson. Um, uh, phenomenon if I, if I remember it was invented, invented by two psych psychologists or psychiatrists of that name and essentially it explains that um, up to a certain point a little bit of stress and pressure uh, is good for us in terms of us being um, efficient so we need enough you know we need a, a bit of a kick up the backside sometimes to get on with our work and there needs to be deadlines and then we can deal with things efficiently but after a while if there's too much of that uh, the, the pressure takes over and there is essentially a um, a scale of symptoms or, or, or a sort of panoply of symptoms that we can start to notice about ourselves and the encouragement really is to be aware of those things uh, to notice what you feel like when everything is going well and you're comfortable and healthy and all of that sort of thing and then to try and notice the things that that probably gradually change so they are you know things like feeling tired a bit snappy with with colleagues uh, you know feeling unable to deal with emails and things starting to eat less healthily uh, you know stopping exercise and, th and therefore feeling more tired and that sort of thing um you know not sleeping very well am i um drink trying to drink a bit more am i not making time to see my family and, and all of those sorts of things i'm not giving you all of the examples but there are things that you start to notice and, and these things there's normally a gradual change you're not suddenly well and then something happens and you know um that, that's it you're unwell uh, over time the, the the workload builds up the stress builds up and these symptoms you know there's one at first and then but it's just in the background then it comes more to the foreground and there are other symptoms as well and and, when, and it's when you start seeing that that is the time to you know be aware of it and to start think about um uh, you know seeking help really f from guidance from the website going to a gp speaking to colleagues and so on because the thing that as i say they just build up and, and then they get to a certain stage and and then that's the problem you know then you are unwell you have a health issue or something goes wrong at work or whatever it might be and so it's really just a question of monitoring those no one will exactly know exactly when the tipping point comes but be aware keep an eye on things and when you start to see more of the symptoms be, beware that's what's happening 
uh, and don't let it go further down the curve, that's the time to step back and say, I need to be doing a bit less work. I need to speak to my clerks and, you know, I, I need to resort to doing 80% of the work or not take that case or this case that I'm doing. I need to pass that on and return that because I've got too much on and the clerks can help you with that. Um, and then and then you can see if that, that helps um, you know, get you back into the right right territory on that curve. So I haven't explained it probably um, it very um, assiduously, but um, have a look at that and there are materials there. Yeah, because yeah, you, you only you really can can be the guy, but but seek help um, when the time if the time arrives. Um, Vicky, um, I, I think um, we, we've um, we've just about been an hour of, of content. Um, uh, I think we've probably covered the main points that we wanted to. Um, thanks for helping us cover those couple of questions. Unless there are any sort of immediate questions that pop up in the um, through the through that function now, um, I think we will um, um, wrap up shortly. Is there anything else that you wanted to sort of finish as a as a closing closing word on, really? Um, just to say thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we, we're always here through Grace to help in any way that um, would be of assistance. So the dialogue doesn't stop today. And 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 um, I, I think we've mentioned it enough times that um, you've got the point. Look at the well-being at the bar website if you haven't already. And, and all the best to everyone and have a lovely evening. Great. Well, thanks, Vicky. Thanks. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. I hope that was helpful. OK. Thank you.